Hello everyone, I hope everyone's having a good day. Today we're going to learn about atoms, isotopes, ions, and more. If you're interested in downloading any of these pages, they're all for free download on my website. Here are some initial thoughts before we dive into the lesson. When we first start studying chemistry, it can come off very overwhelming. No worries, we all felt this way and sometimes still do. Even though it can be challenging at times, the remarkable thing about studying chemistry is that each chapter, topic, and lesson builds to create the language of chemistry and our further understanding of nature. As we continue learning about chemistry, we have to remind ourselves time and time again that chemistry is a constant movement towards greater stability and will behave accordingly. We'll see this played out as we learn new materials. Let's talk about the parts of the atom. The basic building blocks of chemistry and matter is the atom. Each and every atom is composed of three subatomic particles that we'll constantly refer to, which are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Even though the majority of the atom's total volume is empty space, it's the interactions between these particles that allow atoms to behave as life's building blocks. Protons are located in the dense central nucleus and contain an overall positive electrical charge. This is an innate property of protons. Neutrons, on the other hand, while they're also located in the central nucleus, they lack any electrical charge. They're neutral. The proton and neutron form this nucleus, located in the center of the atom, contributing to the overall mass of the specific atom we're talking about. The remaining subatomic particle, the electron, has such a small mass in comparison that it doesn't really impact the overall weight. Electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles. They are found outside of the nucleus, and they are held within the atom by their attraction to the protons in the nucleus. All atoms contain protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yet the different atoms such as hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and more range in the number of subatomic particles they have within their atoms. Throughout the next set of pages, we will learn more about electrons and neutrons and how they may vary, yet the amount of protons in the nucleus is the defining trait of a specific atom. The periodic table of elements lists the numerous elements sequentially based off their atomic number. An element's atomic number represents the number of protons that specifically characterize a specific element, such as hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, lithium has three, and so on. It's the characterizing factor of a specific element. Each element listing will also represent the element's symbol, a two-letter sequence that help represent a specific element, and the atomic mass unit. The atomic mass unit represents the mass of a specific element's atom. There's still so much more we can learn about atoms, even if it's not specifically listed on the periodic table. Since the elements on the table are listed in what we call a neutral state, meaning that the atom itself lacks an overall net electrical charge, the number of protons and electrons must be equal. For example, in the case of hydrogen having an atomic number of 1, in order to ensure that the hydrogen atom is neutral, the number of protons and electrons should be equivalent to cancel out all charges. So in hydrogen's case, as it's listed on the periodic table, we'll have one proton and one electron. There are 118 elements listed on the periodic table, and you do not have to memorize the atomic number and atomic mass unit of each one. Instead, we need to familiarize ourselves with the elemental symbol belonging to each of the elements, either one letter or a sequence of two. Some elements are named after their roots, so the symbols do not match the names that we're used to, such as gold, its symbol is AU. Since not all tables will have their names listed, it's a good idea to get it memorized. Additionally, we'll be referring to their symbols when writing out molecular formulas, such as H2O, two hydrogens and one oxygen, H3PO4, and SiO2, for example. Instead of focusing on memorizing the entire periodic table, it's also more important to relate properties and characteristics of elements based off their positioning in relation to other elements, something that we'll learn as we continue. So let's summarize a lot of the things we've been talking about up until this point. 
We have been learning about atomic theory, the theory proposing that matter is made up of atoms, an atom being built from the three subatomic particles. The dense nucleus at the center of the atom is composed of protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which are neutral. These two particles contribute to 99% of the atom's mass, with neutrons just ever so slightly being heavier than protons. Whereas electrons, which are negatively charged, exist outside the nucleus, held by attractive forces. We've already seen that a change in the number of protons in an atom would change the element that specific atom represents. For example, hydrogen will always have one proton, and helium will always have two, and so on. Yet, yeah, what happens if we change the number of neutrons? Neutrons are important since they allow atoms with multiple protons in their nuclei to form. Through neutron-proton interactions called a strong force, that we'll not dive too much into, which help negates the repulsive forces between two protons. This is how we can have a hydrogen atom with no neutrons. It's the only exception. Additionally, neutrons impact the weight of the atom. And atoms with the same amount of protons, but with a ranging number of neutrons, are called isotopes. Since, as we'll soon learn, chemical properties and reactivity are influenced by the number of protons and electrons, isotopes really only differ in their weight, or radioactivity, that we'll soon learn about. Isotopes for elements can be common and naturally abundant depending on their stability and can be very helpful for different studies of science. For example, oxygen has three naturally abundant stable isotopes, ranging from 8 to 10 neutrons. The isotopes that are the most common are oxygen 16, 8 neutrons, with a 99.76 abundance, and oxygen 18, 10 neutrons, with a 0.20% abundance in nature. There are two different methods we use as a notation for isotopes. The first one is the most common, so let's analyze that one first. We have X. X is representing the elemental symbol, which is listed on the periodic table, which we stated that was important to memorize. A represents the mass. It's rounded to the nearest whole number, for simplicity's sake. And Z. Z is the atomic number, or the number of protons, in that specific isotope. The second notation just shows the elemental symbol and the atomic number. So below, you can see the two most common isotopes of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-13. Carbon-12 is 99.89% abundant, where carbon-13 is only 1.11% abundant in nature. If we have various isotopes for different elements, why on the periodic table is there only listed one weight per element? The atomic weight of elements listed on the periodic table is not of the most common isotope, but is an average based off the natural abundance of all naturally abundant isotopes of that specific element. To ensure we take into account the percentage of lighter or heavier isotopes in any given sample, for example, take into account these three isotopes of oxygen, oxygen 16, 17, and 18. 16 with a 99.76% abundance, 17 with 0.04% abundance, and 18 with 0.20% abundance. So if we take an average of all these isotopes' weights, oxygen 16 is going to have the biggest impact to the overall weight of the average. And so this is more or less what is formulated for each of the atomic masses listed on the periodic table. Let's say you were asked to solve for the average atomic weight of oxygen with these three isotopes. You would take the atomic weight of each of the isotopes and multiply it by their abundance in nature. Then you would sum up all your values and you would get the average atomic weight of oxygen, the value listed on the periodic table. Throughout the past nine minutes, we've been learning about the atom. We have repeated time and time again that the number of protons, signified by the atomic number, represents a distinct element. And if the number of protons are changed, we shift the element we are examining. I wanted to rephrase this point again, 
because throughout this page, we're going to learn what happens when the number of electrons in an atom increases or decreases. While the number of protons remains consistent, the periodic table lists elements in a neutral state. And since the electron and proton have an equal but opposite magnitude of their electrical charge, if there is an equal number of each, the entire atom will be electrically neutral. But if the balance is disturbed, we'll have an overall charge. For example, take into account lithium. As it's listed on the periodic table, it has three protons and three electrons for an overall electrical charge of zero. The charges are balanced, so the atom is electrically neutral. In time, we'll learn many ways in which an atom can gain or lose an electron. If the atom has a net overall charge through a change of electrons, it's referred to as an ion. Cations are ions that have lost electrons and have an overall net positive charge, more protons than electrons. Aions are ions that have gained electrons and have an overall net negative charge, more electrons than protons. For example, let's look at lithium again. In this case, lithium is going to lose an electron and become a lithium cation. Now it only has two electrons, but three protons for an overall positive charge. Later on, when we start to learn about ionization energy, the energy required to pull an electron off an atom in electron affinity, the change in energy within an atom when an electron gets added, we'll be able to characterize which atoms favor gaining an electron and forming aions, or losing an electron and forming cations. For example, beryllium has a tendency of forming cations, losing two electrons, where fluorine has a tendency of gaining an electron and forming an aion. Throughout this video, we've learned a lot. We've learned about protons, neutrons, electrons, talked about the periodic table, introduced isotopes, and introduced ions for future videos when we dive deeper into these topics. I hope this video was able to help with your studies. And remember, all these pages are for free download on my website. And best of luck. Have a good day, guys.